What's up, everybody? I am Johnny Christ, and this is Drinks with Johnny. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this very special Season 3 opener, where I'm joined by a very huge hero of mine, Mr. Fat Mike of No Effects. How are you doing today, man? So, Johnny, uh, how is it our connection? Our connection? Like, I, how can I hear you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you kind of you kind of squiggled out there for a second. Oh no! Well, we got to make I'm sure, sure it it's me, matter. but it looks like I have full bars. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me, Johnny. You look very nice. Thank you, thank you. I cleaned up for you. I appreciate you coming on the show. I look like a dirty Jew. <laughs> uh, I've been living in Joshua Tree for uh, I don't know for like a week now, and I'm just about to leave. I tried to extend our stay for an hour. They said no. Whoa. So where you just camping out there or what? No, we got this uh, tiny uh, house. It's like a mini house. Uh, it's got a bed on the roof. Okay. That's heated. You sleep under the stars. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, it's really awesome. Dude, that's great. I'm I'm glad to see you having a good time out there. Uh, you've been out there for a week, you said? Yeah, about a week. Oh, cool, man. Um, I've been out to Joshua Tree. I used to go shooting there, and I know you don't like guns, but I used to go with like my dad. Uh, just go out you and shoot, shoot what people? No, definitely not people. <laughs> 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 you know, just the you know miscellaneous targets. You know, maybe a ketchup bottle or two, something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I used to shoot things when I was you know twelve. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it has. Um, one of the things that I wanted to have you on the show and talk about. Um, amongst a million, but we'll just start it off with uh, the new record coming out on the 26th, the new No Effects record. Uh, single album. I, single album. Yeah, man. I just got it sent to me yesterday from Vanessa. Uh, prior to you coming on, I listened uh, listened to it since last night. I fucking love it, man. You guys did it again. It's a great record. It's an absolutely cool, thank great Thank you record. very much. Bill Stevenson and uh, Jason uh, Livemore. Uh, Livermore. Livermore, sorry. Uh yeah, they they both produce Bill Stevenson of the, of Descendants, huge Descendants fan right here. Absolutely love them. So I, I got to talk a little bit about Bill there. Um, what was the approach on this record? I know you guys have kind of been either sitting on it or working on it for like two and a half years, something like that. Eric told me yeah. back in June. Well, the approach, you know, I was, I was writing a double album because I thought uh, I don't think anyone made a, a great double album except for Pink Floyd, uh, The Wall. And so, you know, I always try to push myself. So I ended up with 28 songs that we recorded oh. and uh, and just spent, you know, over six months just finishing them and writing lyrics. And when I, the, the thing that was different about this album, Why It's So Dark, is because I was uh, on drugs the whole time while I was writing it. I was just drinking vodka, doing cocaine and some, you know, uh, maybe some DMT now and then. Yeah. So, uh <laughs> It was dark. I wrote most of it at three, four, five in the morning. Okay. And and I'm usually sober when we record albums. Uh, almost always. Not this time. This time I was just doing drugs. Wow. You know? And Bill Stevenson was like, Mike, what's up? Usually I party at the very end of a record, but I'm like, dude, this is what you got. <laughs> That's amazing. And, uh, so it didn't turn out to be a great double album, I don't think. I think... Disc one was better than disc two, so I just made disc one into this into a single album. I added linoleum from disc two and and uh, one more song, and and then I wrote the last resort. That was the last song I wrote for this album. Now, when you're singing on last resort, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and also brought up the fact that you were you were uh, on drugs while you're writing this. Is that beginning of Last Resort, or are, are you uh, actually messed up there? Or is that like, because it sounds, it sounds kind of like you're a little messed up at the beginning of that song. Yeah, sure. I, I, was, I was wasted on, uh, on every track that I sang. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, uh, I was on Booze and Blow, you know, Fuck for that me. whole album. I, I couldn't even imagine that. That's insane. Well, I know now um, you're, you're, you're sober right now, right? Right. That's awesome, man. And how's that been for you? Uh, I love being sober. Yeah. This is, uh, I, I was sober for three months once and I'm somewhere around there, but I'm, I'm shooting for a year. Awesome. And, uh, yeah. I'm doing stuff like hanging out in Joshua tree and hiking. And, uh, yeah, I saw you, uh, um, posted some stuff. You were also hanging out with your daughter not too long ago, went up to San Francisco and visited her. That's right. Like you guys had well, I've always, time. I've always taken, you know, a couple weeks off partying, mm -hmm. but, uh, 
I'm taking a long time now, and it's just uh, yeah, I love being sober, just like I love being wasted. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're they're both di- they're different times. You gotta have your yin and your yang, right? That's that's what gotta have about. balance. You gotta yeah. have balance, and uh, I was not balanced. You know, in the, I was in the middle of. Uh, I'm still in my divorce. Uh, sure. I was, you know, I moved out of my house. I was just lonely and uh, not having a good time. Mm. So we. Right now, strangely enough, I've been sober. Oh shit! I'm breaking up. Just a little bit. You just, uh, you you left off, and then it broke up a little bit right there where you were saying that you. Moved no, out I'm of not house. breaking up. But I'm, I'm divorcing. <laughs> yeah, you're divorcing <laughs> right now. <laughs> Perfect. Not just a breakup. Yeah. But uh, in the past, I've, I have 38 new songs right now that I've written uh, while being sober, which is. In three months, you came up with 38 new songs. Yeah. Holy shit, man! That's a, see. This is why. Uh, I'm such a big fan of you and have been for so long. Um, you know, I, 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 over the years that we've gotten to know each other a little bit, um, you probably, I try and play it cool. So I, you know, I'm not letting you know just how big of a fan I am, (laughs) but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's so cool. Like stories like that, your, your constant creativity and writing is second to none, especially in the punk rock world, but probably just in all rock in my opinion. And, uh, it's just so fucking awesome to talk to you. I mean, I'll bring it up right now. I doubt you remember this. It was a long fucking time ago and I was a shitty little kid. The first time you and I ever met. Do you recall at all? Uh, I was it on the Warp Tour? No, it wasn't. It was actually in San Diego on one of the New Year's Eve things. You were out with uh, me first. And oh, yeah, yeah. Was on that too. And that was the very yeah. first time we met. That was a terrible show. <laughs> a big, I don't know, arena or some place. Yeah, it was, at the, it's at the sports arena, and they were doing it every year. It was the local radio station, it was like 1053 or something like that, one of those. Yeah. And uh, Me First was on there, Avenged. I think Homegrown was one of the other bands, and I had just joined Avenged like probably three weeks before that. And uh, I was out, and, and uh, you were talking with Matt in the, the locker room area, and I walked over, and he's like, Well, what, what's your favorite No Effects record? And I gave the wrong answer because he was expecting me to say Punk and Drublick. And I was like, and I said s and Airlines because in that moment when <laughs> I was meeting you for the very first time, I went right back to my first album that I bought was s and Airlines with my own money at the warehouse around the corner from my house. And wow. I had heard Punk and, and Drublick uh, before. I have to pronounce it. I have to make sure I announce it. When I had Smelly on, uh, a bunch of comments in here. Went, went crazy, kept saying that I was saying punk and trublick with a T. And I was like, I'm uh, sorry I didn't enunciate the D, guys. You guys got to give me a fucking break here. <laughs> no, it, 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 when you say enunciate, it's wrong. It's enunciate. Enunciate. See, I'm, I can't even fucking talk. <laughs> How am I the podcaster here? <laughs> but yeah, I bought uh, uh, S&M Airlines. Airlines. That's cool because, uh, you know, that was our first good album. It wasn't a, it wasn't a great album, but it had good tones, had good songs. My oh, voice was Fucking horrible, but <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I mean, I I got it basically. My brother had uh, shown me Punk and Drublick and uh, loved that album, but he already had it, and we were sharing a room, so I'd hear it all the time. I went down to the warehouse, went down the sleeves looking for No Effects, and I saw a couple of album covers. But then I saw the chick riding the 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 airplane, and I was like, "Yep." My my eleven year old self was like, "Yep, that's the one I want." <laughs> Not hearing a single song before that on it, and then you know coming coming to love it songs like Screaming for Change and uh, Mean People Suck. This is a fucking great record. Yeah, I, th- I think we coined that term, Mean People Suck. It got real popular right after that. I think so. I mean, I remember seeing bumper stickers on people's cars saying Mean People Suck. Uh, it's funny that the there's a maid that just showed up at at our. We got kicked out of this Airbnb, so the maid just showed up. Uh, are they going to kick you out? Like, are we going to be able to finish this podcast? Are they going to? Yeah, I'm in the car. Out? I'm in the car. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Perfect. You're you're right, right on top of it. But yeah, that that one was a six day recording. Six day recorded and mixed in six days. That's what uh, that's what Smelly said. He's he said it was over a weekend, but he was probably just thinking of his part. Yeah. <laughs> As you know, I, it was so awesome having Smelly on and then uh, reconnecting with, with him after, you know, this was during the pandemic. I had him on last season in June. Uh, so we hadn't seen each other in person in a while. And then you guys came in uh, to the studio and we did a little thing for Linoleum on the on the record. 
That was right, an right. absolute blast. You guys came in. You had this great idea for the video. Um, and then uh, we were working on our record that we're still doing. And, um, yeah, you guys came in and we did this little fun video. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the idea there? Like, you just threw it out there. And now you've gotten two videos for one single on the album, which is pretty right. hilarious. Well, the idea was to put in all these bands that have covered Linoleum. Mm -hmm. And you guys being the most famous one. And uh, I called you guys up and... Uh, and asked if you wanted to play a lead on the, on the song. Mm -hmm. And you guys said, hell yeah. And I sent you this song, and, and then you guys said, are you talking shit about us in the song? <laughs> <laughs> in true I, I Mike said, fashion, well, of course. Yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> I wanted to mention you guys, but, you know, uh, and I go, is that a problem? And you guys are like, no. <laughs> you still want to be on it. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, and, and I hang out with, with mm, mm. Shadows. A lot. You know, we golf a lot. <laughs> I love that you call them that. I just I just love it. It's well, that's so how good. it's spelled, right? Am I getting the pronunciation right? <laughs> the, the, pronu the pronunciation? Am I saying it right now, too? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, and you guys fucking shredded the lead. Well, that and was, then, that, uh, was, that was, that was, uh, that was, uh, Sinister and Zachy. I, 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 I just, uh, took credit for it and, and put myself in the music video for no apparent reason. No, well, you, you guys were all in the music video. Yeah, and it was it was just it was super fun to do, and uh, and mm, acted really well too. You, you know, he's got a career there, maybe. You yeah, know. he's got skills. <laughs> that was fun. So then, so then later after you guys released that, we filmed that. Um, it was you were getting a lot of people telling you, well, what about this band, and what about this band that covered Linoleum? So you're like, fuck it, I'm gonna do another one. That's pretty much what how the second. It wasn't one. because of that, actually. Oh, okay. The reason I did another video is because I read comments of all these bands that were, and these and these girls that were like, I can't believe I'm in this video. This is the best thing ever. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of bring more happiness and all the other bands that wanted to, that have covered the song. And that it was 85 more bands that I got to stoke out. Yeah. No, I think know? it was a great idea. I especially love before we were filming at the studio, you're like, uh, I think you were talking to one of your managers there that was there that day. And you guys were talking about, well, what happens if these bands uh, don't want to be in your video? And you're like, Whatever, we'll deal with it when we get there. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah, I, I absolutely love that that uh, that mentality you have. You're just like, I mean, you have no filter. Anyone that knows you knows that you have no filter. You have you don't you don't really give a fuck. You just say what's on your mind, which I think is well. Awesome. I I do give a fuck. That's the thing is okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't say inane uh, remarks. I mean, like what I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Very intelligent. Like the new video, well, thanks. The new video we just did for Fuck Euphemism, I don't know if you've seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. I've heard, I've heard the song, but I haven't seen the video yet. Yeah, the video is getting, uh, it, it, people really love it, and I'm really happy because uh, it's like I talk a lot of shit in that video, but it's it could be some of the best lyrics I've ever written because they're all thought out, and when you first see the lyrics, it looks like I'm talking hella shit, but after a few times you go, Oh, this is really thought out. Mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted. I wanted people to talk shit so I could retort and, and say, no, no, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, I'm saying, uh, like one of the main lines is in the song is, uh, I'm a single, not a plural person. So call me per for the night because a lot of people go by they and them right now. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and I know a lot of they and thems, uh, but a lot of trans people mm -hmm. or people who don't want to identify, identify with one gender and per is short for person and it's a better term to per. say oh i love per oh me and per were hanging out last night isn't per the best instead of they aren't they the best oh are you talking about two people or three people no just one person you know them ah too much for me <laughs> per, per works everywhere I like that. And it's the term, I think. I just think it's a better term. Well, maybe it'll catch on just the same way as Mean People Suck, as we were just talking about. Now it'll be per. I hope so. That'd be good. And I can't take credit, total credit for it because it was, uh, I was reading a feminist writer in college, Doris Lessing, and she wrote one uh, fiction book called The Good Terrorist. And it just, it always stuck with me that in, the, in this book, this woman could see in the future and people called each other per. And I just thought that was so smart. It's yeah. such a great pronoun. So 
and to have that foresight from so personality long. per is a much better word than than they or them well i'm gonna start using that too then just just you know i'll, I'll pretend that i read that book too I'll, i won't say it was you that, that got me <laughs> that, that's that's the messed up thing though is that people get to identify as they want to mm -hmm. but it's so confusing and you know and people call me a cis male which it, i don't want to be called a cis male it's it's kind of weird what it's, do you it, want to be called uh well first i'm a punk rocker you know yeah or but just him is fine uh and when i'm just like a woman him is fine too i mean i'm not i don't identify as a girl mm -hmm. i just like dressing like one sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that's okay man i i mean nothing wrong with that here i i used to fucking throw on some dresses and stuff for some girls when i was in middle school trying to get in their pants you know that that shit happens <laughs> yeah well it's just it's something you know guys aren't allowed to to dress very fun i mean yeah. you're dressed real fun with your hamburgers and stuff oh thank you thank you for noticing. <laughs> i picked up you I'm, I'm biting your style from the me first it's a it's a nice hawaiian shirt for from the me yeah. first and give me give me stuff but it's it's uh it's more to me than just dressing up and mm -hmm. just you know when i'm when i'm with a woman uh i like being feminine you know i like having lesbian sex and being submissive and when you're dressed uh girly it really helps you get into that role. Okay. You know, if you're dressed like uh, Jim from Pennywise, uh, it's not the kind of sex I want to be having with a woman. I don't want to look like a butch lesbian. Okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you, all right. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> uh, you know, I like I like having lesbian sex when there's two girls. Yeah. That's, that's hot for me. Well, uh, so you're, you're touching on a little bit of, uh, of, of that side of your life that I um, famously know about. Um, you started to do a podcast uh, about this where you were going to bring in couples and uh, teach them the ways of the dominatrix and, and all this stuff and, and your beliefs in the, in the bedroom. Um, did that ever come to fruition? Are you still doing it? or? I did a couple of podcasts with uh, Jim Powers, the king of Bukaki, and also with I didn't know Joanna. that there was a title for that. I did not know. Oh, that yeah. He's made over 80 Bukaki movies. Oh, and he's that's the a, king. That's a lot of Bukaki. And then uh, Joanna Angel, and it, it was kind of – sexual sexuality based but uh podcasts are a lot of work a lot of research a lot of setup time and uh i am gonna it is something i'm interested in doing in the future but uh i i want more of a demotivational speaking kind of a thing demotivational yeah yeah because uh you know i have <laughs> happiness in my life a lot and i i think i know how to sh how to bring happiness to people and it's not what most people think. You know, success is not money. Success is happiness. And if you find out what makes you very happy, then everything else it just comes easier. Mm -hmm. You know, if Americans would stop thinking money brings them happiness, it doesn't. It 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 helps. It's nice to have money, but yeah, you want that security you know, factor. I, I was I was just as happy when I was eighteen living in a van. Yeah. You know, dude, money I, didn't bring me happiness. No. Punk rock. Punk rock and and uh, and passionate sex brought me happiness. I like both of those things right there that you named. That that, that sounds that that's that's absolute happiness to me too. And living in a van too. I mean, you you got like you mentioned. I got to imagine that was Econo vans back then, right? I mean, that's like Econo line, yeah, yeah, Econo line, yeah. We've we've all done a bunch of those, right? <laughs> and, and you know, uh, three years ago, uh, my my wife and I, uh, Soma Snake Oil, we we did a vacation. You know, we spent a couple weeks in the Econo line, uh, going up and down California, sleeping in the van. Sometimes we'd get motel rooms just so we could, uh, you know, take a shit in the morning. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you didn't, you didn't want to keep pulling the old bag out of the window trick, you know? No, no. I, don't, I had a bed in the back of the van, and it's just, it's fun. You know, it's urban camping. Yeah, Love no, it. that's awesome. That's, that, I mean, honestly, that does sound great. It kind of sounds nostalgia you know, nostalgic, sorry, rather, uh, to go back and do something like that. Like, uh, in doing this show, I mentioned on another episode where I was loading gear into uh, a dressing room to interview Mick Foley from the WWF, and it just felt weird, like, lugging gear again for the first time in forever. And I was <laughs> like, this is actually kind of cool. What I, what I think is so funny is, especially on the Warp Tour, you see bands working out mm -hmm. while their roadies are loading their gear. And it's like, wait, you wait, know, wait, who are you talking about there, Mike? I, I, I might know. <laughs> are you calling me out again? <laughs> oh, no, no. I was, actually talking about, I was talking about against me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so we weren't the originators of it. I got you. <laughs> or Rancid, you know, or, or 
any band that works out. Yeah, I mean, I remember my first work tour. Work out, but it's funny because loading gear is a workout. Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, so I just think it's kind of, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's funny to see people working out, but I don't want to carry anything, dude. <laughs> Oh man, I don't. I don't say. I. I will say. I'm not one of the ones who's just like. I don't want to carry anything. It's just. It just kind of happened over the years that we don't do it anymore. But no, yeah. I remember like working out. I remember you, you mentioned rancid. Like Tim would be in the in the back of one of those big ass trailers with the the bench press bar and everything. That was like the first time I met Tim and uh, saw you guys on Warp Tours back in like 2003. I want to say and that was a huge moment for me because I we just came out with Waking the Fallen or we were promoting it or some shit like that and uh yeah it was my first warp tour experience was with you guys no effects and rancid headlining the main stages and, and bad was, religion and bad religion too yeah, yeah that, that, that may have been the best warp tour it was it was a, it was phenomenal i had such a blast it, and it was really like great you know that's one of the things about punk rock that i think is well different than metal is that bands are really supportive and not as uh uh they're not competitive yeah you know like like when when the deftones did warp tour they're the only band that did warp tour and ozfest and then they came back to warp tour and said oh man it's so much nicer to be on warp tour because bands like hang out and they watch each other play yeah. and there's not this anger or like we're gonna kick their ass today it's just like you just go up and have a good time yeah no and, I, I you nailed it right there too warp tour was that for for us too like Coming in, we had a little bit of stuff before um, metal scenes, you know, trying trying our best, being very serious, very competitive. Getting out there on Warp Tour for the years that we did it was like our college years, I say it, because I mean it was it was such a learning experience to see how you guys and all of our favorite punk rock bands were living on the Warp Tour and just like hanging out and this camaraderie. Everyone's helping each other out, not against each other. And right, I right. really think that shaped us and humbled us moving forward in our career. And uh, I think it's that's probably huge. why we're friends. You know why I'm friends with you guys because it's certainly uh, not because you like metal music. So we <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But you know, but you guys uh, are are super cool dudes, and uh, you. and you know, like I I was hanging out with James Hetfield once, uh, and he was a just a total dick, really. You know? and, and I had something, yeah, because he had no he has no respect for people he doesn't know. Okay. Like he didn't know me. I'm like, oh, how you don't know me? I'm this band, no effects, and. And I, I said two sentences, and he was like, and it went back to talking to someone else. Wow. He didn't, didn't say, like, oh, that is interesting. Excuse me, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to this conversation. Uh, well, I will say there's two things. I've, I've, I've had uh, interactions with James over the years. We toured with them, became friendly with the guys in Metallica, and I've talked to him a few times. I've gotten great responses from him, and he's been real, nothing but kind to me. But I will say – I don't know if this is the case, but he has become a little hard of hearing. So I don't know when this was, but well, this he, was a long time ago. Okay, okay. This so was might, at might least have 20, that excuse. At least twenty years ago. Okay. Uh, but it's just been the case, you know. Uh, like Deftones, I, those guys are great. Yeah. Uh, and but about half the metal bands I've met, like Megadeth, those guys are just fucking weirdos. <laughs> you know, we do ones <laughs> and. But you know if, where, how did I, I miss that? No effects toured with Megadeth. In 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 uh yeah in Australia it was like a big day out thing. Oh okay and, yeah. Uh, and uh, we just we we'd make fun of them a lot. But Dave Mustaine he like he yelled at a restaurant manager for not having Lay's potato chips. Like in Australia. I was like, yeah yeah. <laughs> I need Lay's potato chips. They the certain oil it helps my singing. And I'm like, really. Something helps your singing. Is this how your voice sounds when something helps it? Because, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not really singing. It's more like drooling. Well, well, <laughs> well <sing word. laughs> and it's how he treated a manager at a restaurant. Like I would, I couldn't imagine ever treating someone like that. Isn't that like, isn't that so uh, unsettling when you see that? I, I, I've, I, my grandfather years ago would do this and, and berate waitresses and stuff and you just sit there so uncomfortable because you don't know what to say you know what i mean like it's, it's, it's great great is the word great so you you're just you know not, not berate he's he's berating a waitress's hair berating yeah 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 i just i, I emphasize the braid on it berating sorry See, I gotta see. This is why I'm just gonna have you on, like listening every time I do something. You just be in my ear and be like, "No, that's not how you say it, Johnny." 
<laughs> that's fantastic. Um, yeah, going back to like some of some it's of the embarrassing when someone treats someone uh, badly. Yeah, uh, and and uh, you, and rock stars seem to do that, you know, on a regular basis. It's unfortunate. And, uh, I just and punk rockers, you know, we don't. I think you know, there's still some jerks, but we tend to be the coolest and friendliest because we all we all feel lucky where we are. We're not where we are because you know we're necessarily great players. We just have, uh, you know, something about punk bands. Uh, it hits people. It hits people's hearts. Yeah, I know. It, I know it definitely hit me when I was, you know, about like I said when I picked up S and M Airlines when I discovered punk rock through my brother who was like ten years old, and uh, you know, it's really cool to hear you talk about. You've always said it over the years about not necessarily a great musician, all that kind of shit. And I'm like sitting there transcribing stuff, and I'm like, no, Mike, you're a pretty fucking good musician. Like, uh, <laughs> well, I wasn't back then. How's that? <laughs> Okay, I mean, I, I, I can't, I can, I can't speculate on that. But I wanted to talk to you, uh, bass player, bass player, a little bit about that. Like, um, uh, Jay Bentley was on the show, and we were talking about your style of up picking the entire time, upstrokes, which is very unorthodox. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to talk to you about that. Like, is that something you saw somebody else doing, and we're like, I'm gonna do that, or is that just something that came naturally to you when you picked up the bass the first time? Well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm. Unorthodox. I'm an un unorthodox Jew, actually. Uh, <laughs> I somehow knew that was coming. I don't know. Why. Yeah, I, <laughs> no, I just I taught myself how to play bass, mm -hmm. and it just seemed easier. Like there's more control if you do upstrokes than downstrokes. Uh, I don't know why I thought that, but it makes it easier for me to do some of my strumming patterns. Yeah. Where you know if you're if you're holding your hand above the bass string. And you try to do some of my weird circular patterns. It's it's next to impossible. You have to plant your pinky on the bass, and you know do upstrokes if it's going to work. So that's just something that happened over the years. Wow. You know, because one of the things about no effects, which people don't notice, uh, is that you know we we all play very lightly, which is you know that's that's how you get a good sound. Uh, I had to learn that actually, that really, because Hefe uh, plays so lightly. We're like, what and and Melvin used to break strings all the time, also because our strings were old. Uh, <laughs> but Hefe never did. You know, that's one of the reasons, you know, uh, we don't have spare guitars <laughs> on tour. Yeah, we wait, have, wait, you don't have spare guitars? I only have, have one bass. That's it. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because once at a festival, uh, someone like bumped into my bass or, or I broke a string and I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> and we had to borrow a bass from another band. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I, I have I have an, another bass that uh, when we're doing uh, separation of church and skate, we have it because it's tuned different. Because mm -hmm. we have one one lower tuning, so everyone has a second guitar like that. But Hefe only has that one Strat, that one Telecaster. And Melvin has his one uh, guitar too. Yeah. So I, I don't know why we do that. It's kind of silly. Yeah, but, not, not to have a backup is just wild, is wild to me. I mean, I, I didn't have a back. I had a similar story of borrowing another bass when I broke like three strings. I used to slam the shit out of the bass, especially when I first joined the band. And I would, I would constantly be breaking strings on these basses. And the guys and the rest of the guys in the band were like, "This guy's fucking out. He can't keep. We can't keep this." Yeah, guy. you do He's know, Johnny, that when you hit a bass string hard, it goes sharp. Yeah, it just goes sharp. So the bass player, more than anybody, has to play soft. It's, you're you're absolutely right. I had to learn that, and I actually over the years I learned to switch from the pick because that's where I was just like slamming it and everything. And now I I predominantly play with my fingers. I I feel like I have more control that way. Yeah, I feel like I have less control with my fingers, and there's just certain styles that I play you can't mm -hmm. you, you can't do with your fingers. Yeah. Oh no, I, totally. I mean, listening to some stuff like I remember early on, uh, stuff in the decline and songs like that where it makes sense after you study it a little bit that you are doing the upstrokes is that I'd be listening to him go like, how the fuck is he circling around those three strings and making it sound like there's two basses playing the same fucking part? Like I didn't understand <laughs> it for so long. And I was like, I, I, cause I, you know, you pick up tablature, you learn as much as you can by ear when you're transcribing your heroes and you're going through it. And you know, I'm like, but it still doesn't sound like him. What the fuck am I doing wrong? Yeah. It's, it's well, bass player magazine did a little story on that baseline. Oh, they did. But they they neglected to ask me. They just they just wrote about it. Oh, they just speculated, <laughs> and they said it was done with your fingers. And I'm like, what a bunch of dodos, you know? Like, fuck. Uh, 
they could have asked me if they if they were impressed by it, they could have seen how it's actually done. Well, do you want to clear the air right here? How how are like I know it's the upstrokes and like you're normally doing, but how yeah, it's is a it? triplet. It's a triplet that starts with upstrokes. You know, okay. Uh, on the uh, I don't know what's it called, a B string. I don't fucking know. The fourth <laughs> string and the third string. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just I just did this little thing on Loudwire where they said, "Can you show us how to play some of your favorite riffs?" And I've never done that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, you know. Since I've never heard of Loudwire and they paid me nothing, I decided to do it for them. <laughs> never heard of them either. I love that. <laughs> You've been in the music industry for how long now, Mike? And you have never heard of Loudwire? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm in my music industry. That's true. But, you know, it, like is, it is on the metal side of things. Fat Records is in uh, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And I, I know some bands from the Warp Tour, but like no effects, we've never opened for anybody before. We've never done tours like that. Uh, and I know punk rock because I'm in punk rock. Yeah. But I don't really know the music industry. I've never bought a guitar player magazine, magazine or, or Rolling Stone. I don't know, or Spin. I mean, it doesn't, they don't mean anything to me. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, but you've, you've carved out and paved your own way that way. I mean, you mentioned uh, Fat Records. When, when did you start Fat Records again? In 91. 91. Okay. So, I mean, that's it's been 30 years. Been 30 and, years. and, you know, I didn't look at, at major label contracts to figure out how to treat bands. That's why Fat's always done one record deals. And, uh, you know, all the money we spend in marketing and stuff, we pay for that. We, we just do things differently. I love that. I love that approach. And you do it by... You know, I was on Epitaph, so I know how we were treated by them, and I wanted to be treated that way. I wanted to treat bands that way. And, yeah, Epitaph uh, was good. Epitaph was 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 huge um, at that time uh, for all the punk rock bands that were coming out. That were, I mean, getting that level of success like you guys and in, in Rancid and Offspring, of course, with the biggest independent selling record on, with Smash and everything like that. Like, yeah. it's just, uh, um, man, Epitaph was was doing some really cool shit in the nineties. Yeah, it seemed like all the first bands they signed got big, except for Down By Law. Mm-hmm. Same thing happened with Fat. You know, the first bands I signed were Propagandi, Lagwagon, No Use for Name, Face to Face, Strung Out. All the greats, man. They all got big. Dude, one of my favorite records that uh, that uh, Lagwagon put out was, was Haas. Like, that fucking record to me was just well fucking put together. Yeah, that, well, their last record with Derek... Uh, and the last one I, I uh, co-produced too. Oh, you did. Okay, cool. Did you? Was that with the? Uh, was that just yourself, or was that with the decomposers? It, no, it was me and Ryan Green. Okay. But I didn't put I didn't put producer credit on all those early albums, even though I produced all of them, because I didn't want it to seem like I was like signed to my label and you're going to get stuck with me in the studio. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is I cared so much when when I started my label, I wanted every release to be great. So, you know, out of our first like 15, 20 records, the only record I wasn't in the studio for was Face to Face. And that's still, I mean, that's still like, that's currently the way it's going, right? Because I mean, I know I talked to Jenny Cutterell of uh, Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and you uh, helped produce The Ride with, with them. Yeah, I, I produced their last two records. Well, I, it hadn't been the case. Like, I, I used to like to produce one record a year and it would end up being a real Mackenzie's record. I just, I, uh, I, don't, I don't really like producing bands unless I really see something in them okay. and I, that I can help them become a great band. And this year, it just I produced six records over the past year and a half. I produced Mad Caddies, their their cover album, and I produced a No Effects album, uh, Bad Cop, The Bomb Pops, uh, Days and Days, and Get Dead. Yeah, get, get Dead, uh, you know, it got voted best rec- best punk record of the year on a bunch of sites. Uh, How do you approach those uh, those records differently from a no effects record, though, or is there any difference? I mean, when you're producing somebody else's music, it's not it's not you writing it and doing all that, obviously. So where uh, well, how do you I pro- suggest I, I like a band to keep their style, and and, and I'll hear style uh, like I, I just did a band called The Last Gang. Okay, and I suggest chords and some melody changes, but I I don't touch like lyrics or uh, I, I like a band to sound exactly like they sound. Mm-hmm. I just like to make their songs catchier, and uh, 
Except except for like like bad cop, bad cop. I'm like, you know, you guys are, are uh, smart women. You could sing songs that have more social relevance. Mm-hmm. You know, you could be more like a riot girl band, uh, but melodic like Bad Religion. There's no one doing that. Uh, just because you play melodic punk doesn't mean it has to be, you know, fun for everyone. Why don't you sing about some issues that you've had during your lives? So I'd like push them to write better lyrics. I really push Stacey D hard. Yeah. And, and she'd send me lyrics. I go, these are way better, but you still got a ways to go. And that's how I produce. That's awesome, man. So, I mean, that's, that's so rad that you could put on that hat though and like really push somebody. Cause I working with different producers over the years, it, it does make a difference. Like who you're in that, who's the, the extra member in that, in that studio, you know what I mean? And what they're, you know, the producer's job to get something more out of you. It's you, but you tapping your potential, I guess. is Right. Is, yeah. And, and most producers, that's why Bill Stevenson is good to work with because he's a great songwriter. Most producers have never fucking written a good song. Yeah. You know, they're just like, they've been around studios and they've been on a couple big albums, but I wouldn't trust a producer that hadn't written songs that I was very impressed with. Yeah. Oh, that's I mean, what Bill Stevenson it really is about. Anyone can make a, rec- a song sound good. That's not hard. It's about making the song touch people. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, uh, Bill Stevenson is, 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 you know, one of in the, one of the most legendary bands in my life that I fucking absolutely love. I mean, even there's a song on cool to be you. Like when they came back out with cool to be you, uh, two records ago, and they had been silent for a while. And then that came out and we were listening to that record as a band, like every day before we went on stage. Cause it was, you know, that, so fun. that's funny. Cause that record did not, that was the one that came out on fat records. Yeah. And it didn't get, uh, the, the accolades it deserved. I, I don't think I, I, I can't imagine why. I mean, I, did, so I didn't good. hear any about that. It's such a great fucking record. The yeah. song, uh, 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 about his dad passing and stuff. It's, yeah. just, it's, it's an incredibly honest record. I mean, descendants have always had some of those songs, but as you know, being a descendants fan too, uh, they have a lot of the fun stuff too. A lot of the, yeah. you know, smell my farts fucking kind of shit, you know, going on yeah, yeah. too. But then like this, the, the, the maturity came in and the descendants and like everything sucks. And then cool to be you really came out. And then the, the hyper, uh, the last one, the, the ADD one. But uh, yeah, that was, <laughs> I mean, to me, cool to be you is, is, is up there as one of the greatest descendants records. And that's yeah, hard to say because I, they have a lot I of great absolutely records. agree. I totally agree, and people think I'm crazy for saying that. They go, "Oh, it's just because it's on Fat Records." I'm like, "No, I think the songs are really good." No, they're fucking, they're great. But uh, yeah, so um, that goes back to, or it doesn't really go back to. Fuck it, I'm just gonna jump around a little bit. Another uh, person that I had on on the show last season is your boy Frank Turner. You guys did West Coast and Wessex together, the the split EP. Um, I fucking loved that that EP. I loved your guys' covers of, of of his songs. You know, his folky songs, and you're just you know, pick the ones yeah. you loved and then, and then went for it. Uh, what was your favorite song that no effects did? And what was, uh, your favorite song that Frank did of you guys? Well, I think the best song on the album is, uh, falling in love. Mm-hmm. I think he just nailed a great it. one on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, my ex-wife, Aaron, she said she, she could stop listening to it. She kept crying because, you know, I wrote that song about us and, but it never really had the sentiment that he brought to it when he did it. It just, uh, it made me so happy because, I really I like that song, but he made it better, and uh, super super cool. Uh, and I think we nailed like we both tried. There were there are no songs that just that we just said. Ah, oh, we'll just throw this on. No. So I think maybe Glory Hallelujah is my favorite one that we did. I I, I would have to agree with that. So so uh, I I agree with that one. And I could see why falling in love would be your favorite. And make it makes a lot of sense from from Frank's side. But for me, eat the meek. What he did differently with that song, I thought was really cool too. So yeah, that, super that cool. Was, yeah, I, I I had a blast talking with Frank. He he mentioned that you guys met out in like Reading or Leeds or something like that years ago. Yeah, yeah. What was and we the, became? Yeah, we became. We're really really good friends. Hung out a lot, and uh, this is. I just I gave him this idea. They came off stage. I go, dude, let's do each other's songs for a split, and he was like, "Fucking amazing!" Yeah, okay, we'll do it. And he called me later, an hour later. He's like, "No, I'm in. We're doing this." And I didn't hear from him for like six months. He goes, oh, we're almost done. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, we're almost done too. <laughs> but we hadn't even thought about what songs we were going to do. <laughs> and that, that's while we were recording. We were finishing up single album. Okay. 
So I'm like, uh, guys, we have to put this on hold. Let's do the Frank Turner split because because COVID had already, we were already in COVID, mm -hmm. and we all thought this would be a fun record to release during COVID because it's not so depressing. It's actually a, a feel good record. Oh, it really is. Uh, I'll, I I love the kids singing that the uh, the uh, what is it the the world's gonna end or or God oh no God's God's not not real like the kids singing uh, folky in the background on that <laughs> I, I thought that was I thought that was brilliant um, you mentioned again the, the single album and uh, you guys have been working on it for a long time or or like you said it was a double album now it's a single album hence the title and it's coming out February 26. Was there any strategy to why you're releasing it now? Or is it just like, oh, we got it down to the we've, 10 songs we like, let's go. Yeah, we, we've never had a strategy. You know, a lot of bands put out a record and then tour. Yeah. We've never done that. <laughs> That's uh, what Smelly was saying too. I just wanted to uh, get the, get it from you as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just, uh, we just put out records and then tour when we feel like it. So That's awesome. Because, you know, you don't make money doing records anyway. Records are just something people can listen to and, and be stoked on, and then you make money live. And so what the fuck's the difference? Uh, it's just how we do it. Yeah, that's... You, you know, the double album was also called Single Album. Which is <laughs> it was still going to be Single Album? Yeah, yeah. It was called Single Album. Uh, I thought it was super funny. Well, when it's, it's like the 25, when it's like the 25 year album. anniversary, when it's like the 25 year anniversary someday down the line, when it's there, you go ahead and release it as a double album, still call it single album again. Yeah. Well, I just <laughs> thought it'd be funny. People go, why? So why did you call your double album single album? I don't know. It's just called single album. <laughs> and, I, and then Fat Rick is like, oh, it's only going to be a single album. What are we going to call it now? Same title. It's a single album. <laughs> I love I love your wittiness, your sense of humor. It's it's always been something that I've been a fan of uh, over the years. Uh, especially, I mean, after uh, Punk and Trouble came out, uh, there was the follow up, Heavy Petting Zoo, which I believe turns twenty five this year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. And I I read somewhere back in the a while back that um, these were that that album was in a new key for you, and you were having a, a little 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 rough time singing on, in that key. Well, I just didn't, I didn't understand that there were better keys to sing in. And I just wrote a lot in G. I don't know why, but my voice sounds way better in C or in A. So I think the album sounds a little lethargic. That was, you know, it's, it, uh, I see some cool songs on it. I just think it's probably our worst album. Our first, really? Our worst modern album. That is wild to me. It's one of my favorite albums that you guys have. I mean, I, I loved, uh, I, one of the things, uh, Dewey help us. I don't, uh, from the peer pleasure podcast as a friend of mine, uh, he came to your house, had to wear the dress, got in the pool with you and you were on his, you were on his podcast. It was amazing. Listen, by the way. Um, uh, he was, uh, but in that, in, in that, uh, podcast you guys did together, uh, you were mentioning the chords and how the, how, you know, you, you in no effects, the chords tend to change quite a bit throughout the same song. Like you're yeah. going back to a verse and there's new notes in those chords, you know. And one of the first times I realized that was trying to transcribe Hot Dog in a Hallway. And I was like, why does this verse, I'm playing the same thing, but I'm hearing something different in this fucking next verse. Why is that? And then it wasn't until last year I heard that podcast. I went, of course, that's what it was. <laughs> right. Well, eat, the song Eat the Meek, that's the song that really fucks with people. Yeah. No. That, yeah. There's three verses and they're all different. Yeah. And they're all 16 chord progressions. So, you know, when bands have tried to cover that, they're like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> well, that's why, why? Everyone, that's why everyone just covers linoleum. It's, it, it's, it's a much simpler song to cover. I know, it's so weird. <laughs> but the new writing I've been doing, like I have a few songs that uh, don't repeat at all. You know, it, there's no pattern to the song at all. And this is some of the, the 38 songs you're, you've yeah. been talking about? That's awesome. I can't and wait the, to hear that. Is to do that and not have people notice, you know, like the, the end of decline where it goes, and so we go on with our lives. Mm -hmm. That's thirty-two chords without a pattern. Wow, and uh, that's it's incredible. really hard to remember. It's fucking super hard to remember, but you wouldn't notice because it just is that, is that why you guys don't play it that often? You've only played it a couple of times. No, we played it a lot. Okay. <laughs> I, will, uh, I remember for a lot of years, it was like you guys weren't playing it. And then uh, now, uh, actually, yeah, because Frank mentioned as well, that was one of the things he got to come up on stage and play with you guys because he was the only one that knew it. And he was like trying to keep his cool because he's like, does he know that I know literally everything he's written? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's why I like Frank's songs is because he uses really cool 
chords too. Yeah. Uh, and weird tunings. I don't use weird tunings. Yeah, but the end of decline. I, I'm, that's one of my mo the songs I'm proudest of. Not the whole song, but the ending. I, I love. You know, I, I like to let melody dictate where chords go. And as you sing melody, you try different chords. Oh, this chord would be good here. Oh, sure. And then the next. Oh, this chord would be good. And that's. You know, I don't. I don't like. I don't write a riff and then try to sing over it ever, because uh, you're in a box. Mm -hmm. Like you can only sing so many melodies before it gets boring. And then, so, so that's just your approach all the time. You're just going, oh, this sounds like I could go there. This sounds like I could go there, and this will, this will. Yeah, and that's why most of my songs for the past 10 years, 12 years, have been, there's eight chords. I don't mean eight different chords. I mean, the pattern is not a four-chord pattern. Yeah. It's an eight-chord pattern. So I usually use six or seven chords in an eight-chord to 16-chord pattern in my verses, and and the courses are, are pretty much the same. Now, when you say of that, course, that sounds all very math. Up. Yeah. So what, yeah, when you say that, that all sounds mathematical. Is is it a mathematical approach or is it more creative? And you're just like, not this mathematical is just how it goes. at all. Yeah. It just I let melody dictate where the songs where goes. go. That's that's that, that's and that's what I bring to. That's what I bring when I produce. Mm -hmm. Which you know, like only punk bands let me produce them, but I've, there's other bands I've always wanted to produce because I'm got, let me just throw in some chords here. It make it'll make you think about music differently. You know, it's 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 why Beatles songs have so many crazy chords, but they all sound like simple songs. No one ever thinks what a weird chord that is in a Beatles that song. You just so, how catchy it is. That is so true and so awesome that you brought that up. I told Smelly this when he was on the show. I've always considered your your songwriting and no effects in general, the Beatles of punk rock. That's just how I've always I've always seen it. Yeah, yeah. Without well, even I, thinking I, about the chords. I consider that that I consider that too. I don't I don't say that. Yeah. Well you yeah. let me say it. You don't have to say it. <laughs> but I, I've never uh, there's only been like two Beatles songs actually figured out. One was uh, both because the gimmies. Yeah. But you know that that song, uh, "All My Lovin'." Great song. It's it's the verse is a sixteen pattern uh, verse, it, and it's it's exactly how I write. Like, why did you change so many times? It sounds so simple, but it's totally not simple. Yeah. And but that's why songs. Uh, that's what makes people listen to songs. For a longer period of time, you can write something super catchy, but you get sick of that song because you've heard it. Yeah. You know, if you hear the chorus eight times, you're going to get sick of that t song eight times more. Where Linoleum or Bob, there is no chorus. So, valid point. Yeah, I know that makes perfect sense. And that's funny that you say you only transcribed like two Beatles songs. So, like, it was just kind of a happenstance that you and Paul kind of write in that same way. I mean, yeah, I, I just let melody dictate where the guitar goes. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I, I never really thought about. It. I don't. I don't know how to play. Really, I don't know how to play people's songs, and I don't remember people's lyrics at all. Like Bad Religion, I know how to play two songs by Bad Religion, and they're my favorite band. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't remember any of the words except for you know we're only gonna die, and there's one more Bad Religion song I, I know the lyrics too. That's that's it's, hilarious. My me. mind just doesn't work that way. Yeah. I just I don't. Well, how um, do, was it? Was it? Was it just a challenge for you? Is that why you wanted to do me first in the Gimme Gimmies? You're like, I'm going to challenge myself then, because I don't know how to play anyone else's music. I'll never no, remember the lyrics. No, it's just, it was just. I just, uh, me and Joey both, you know, liked covers, and you know, they had done, we had done uh, a song by Fleetwood Mac. They had yeah. done Bad Moon Rising. We're like, you know, we should get, we should do a cover band like this and get a really good singer. Yeah. You know what's funny? You just mentioned you did the Fleetwood Mac song, uh, You Could Go Your Own Way. That was on s and Airlines. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know who Fleet Mac, Fleetwood Mac was at the time. I thought that was your original for so many years. <laughs> <laughs> I was no, like, that, that that I, was like I would listen to the record and be like, man, that's a, that last song is it's a real departure from the rest of the album. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. And was, also, you know, we, and like Vincent, that's a cover we did. We threw, mm -hmm. we threw in a couple covers now and then. But I... I don't. I didn't like doing big hit covers, but you know the gimmies. We did that, but I I did learn something about songwriting in the gimmies. I already was doing it, but I was like, oh, Barry Manilow, wow, that guy can write, and because his chord progressions and modulations are really crazy. I've never delved uh, into that. I got to check that. Well, as Elton John's very Elton very John, different yeah. play, where uh, you know, where most of the songs we do are really simple, like John Denver, super easy. I, I wouldn't even know. I, I don't. 
Is John Denver and does the sunshine on my shoulders fucking song? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, that's like probably the only John Denver song. I but know but about. he did write a couple songs that are really fucking crazy. Yeah, that that one's pretty hard, and and Annie's song is is really weird. But you know, he died in a very small airplane crash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I needed to know that little fun fact there, <laughs> but I'm glad he threw it in. <laughs> Speaking of dying and, and fucked up things, um, what about this, uh, the cancer survivor that uh, on the new uh, single album? Uh, My friend can survive cancer. Can survive cancer, yes. Uh, I listened to this song, and I'm listening to it, and I'm like, man, this is fucking heavy. You know, this is, you know, in... in, in Poetically spoken in only the way Fat Mike can, you know, singing well, through it. Well, you know, I, the, the story is all true. I, I, from knowing you and knowing no effects in general, I, I immediately knew this was yeah. a real story. The thing is, though, is that uh, I played it for my friend Jeffrey and he, from Tilt. He goes, oh, is his name Brett? I go, yeah, yeah, Brett. He's like, yeah, he's been telling people he's had brain cancer for 10 years. No fucking That's way. how he gets free merch. No fucking way. Yeah, so I just fell for not it. Not only did he get, not only did he get free merch, he got a song written from fucking Fat Mike to be on, the, on the new album. He also got another song, which was going to be on the second disc, called "The Fake a Wish Foundation." Fake a <laughs> w- <laughs> now you got to release that one. You got to release that one. <laughs> yeah, I will someday. But uh, yeah, so that's the jig is up. Everyone's gonna know now. Yeah, everyone knows now. They're gonna listen to this. Be like, "Oh, this is so sad," and then they'll remember this little conversation about it, and they'll be he like, "He sent me a photo of him in the hospital, and they, they, it was a dated photo, so it was four years old." He's like, "Just got out of the hospital," and it was four years <laughs> wait, wait, hey, wait, 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 wait. Like when he sent it, it was dated. Like you could yeah. read the date, and he was yeah, yeah, yeah. St- oh yeah, yeah. my <laughs> god, how did you ever get swindled by this guy, Mike? <laughs> Believe people. I trust people. I mean, that's a that's a good quality to have. Person. What can I say? But I mean, I guess you get him at the end because you you do say uh, uh, something along the lines of uh, your life will be short, so you got this short song. I, like this song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was you know only 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 you can pull that off. I think. No shit. The owner of this house is coming. I, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, right. I got to take off, Johnny. All right, cool man. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, dude, we'll have to... Let's golf sometime, hey? Yeah, dude, absolutely. I would love to golf with you. Um, if you, if I could get you back on in a couple of days, I need to do a promo with you. If we can do that, I could do that. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, I'll hit you up. Um, I'll just get my. I'll, can I just get your number from Matt? Call it that way. Yeah. All right, cool, man. Uh, well, appreciate you. Thanks again for being on the show. Uh, you could follow Fat Mike everywhere on Instagram, fucking Twitter at at Fat Fat Mike Dude on Instagram. Fat Mike of No Effects on Twitter. No Effects everywhere. You're pretty easy to fucking find. Thanks again for yeah. being on the fucking and, show. And you like the new album. That makes, that makes me happy. I love the new album. I can't wait to listen to it over and over again as I have many of the others. Cool, dude. All right, take care. See you, man. Cheers. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Drinks with Johnny, the season opener, season number three. Thanks again to Fat Mike of No Effects for being on the show. That was an awesome conversation. So much more to get into with that guy. I can't wait to have him in person down the line. We'll definitely make that happen. And uh, as he mentioned, we're probably going to go golf together. So that'll be fun, too. Uh, anyways, uh, make sure you guys are subscribed right here on the, on the YouTube channel. Leave us a comment. Tell us about your favorite moment of the show. Why not? Uh, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And head over to drinkswithjohnny.com for everything Drinks with Johnny. Till next time. Cheers.